So good morning from Hellenic Mediterranean University in Crete, in Greece. It's a great pleasure. It's a great pleasure and honor to have all of you here in order to discuss with our distinguished students, panelists, um, the challenges, the opportunities, and their proposals for more internationalization in our universities, um, particularly for Athena European University Alliance and HMU that I represent. The opinion of the students is very crucial for us in order to plan our internationalization actions and a plan and execute actions that matches match the needs of our students and their priorities for their studies, for their employment, for their research. So in the in the Athena, but also in Hellenic Mediterranean University in particular, you know, students, we would like students to have a strong say in all the missions of the university. My name is Kostas. Uh, I, I work for Athena and also for Hellenic Mediterranean University. Uh, this is one of the activities, the second activity that our alliance organizes in order to celebrate Erasmus 20, 2023. However, we can celebrate since in our neighborhood in Crete that I'm locating, the situation is not so happy because of the what is happening in our neighborhood in Middle East. So we hope for better days. And uh, all, and this is the time now to provide the floor to my colleague from University of Marie Curie Kolosiowa in Poland, which is one of the partners of the Athena European Alliance. Uh, we have also our coordinator, uh, Nuno, here with us, um, and also our student board uh, president and uh, the president of Athena ESN, uh, Mr. Psaltakis. But I will provide the floor to Carolina to moderate. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. You are all very welcome. And as all of you know, the Erasmus Days is an initiative aimed at uh, on uh, disseminating the results of a uh, project uh, under the Erasmus Plus program, as well as promoting active participation. Uh, today, we will give uh, the floor to the students. We will focus on their experience, uh, challenges and, of course, opportunities. Uh, our guest will speak about internationalization of higher education from students' uh, point of view. Uh, we hope that our expert will encourage you to be the part of internationalization process of higher education. And the plan of our roundtable is uh, like following. Um, in the first part, uh, our experts will answer some crucial questions on uh, internationalization uh, process. And in the second part, uh, you will be able to ask the questions. Uh, if he, somebody has uh, their questions ready already, please uh, put it on the chat. It will make the things easier. Um, as Kostas said, my name is Karolina Sokolinska, and I'm working in Erasmus office at uh, Maria Kiliskodowska University uh, in Lublin, in Poland. And I'm honored to be uh, the moderator of uh, today's roundtable. And at the beginning, I would like to um, introduce you to our special guests, students and uh, alumni. Um, can I ask you, I will uh, read your names and please wave just to, <laughs> just to know who is who. So, the George. Here is George Yasson. Rita. Where is Rita? We have Rita here. Katerina? Hello, uh, Tangui? And Nassim. So, there are our experts. And at the beginning, I would like to ask our speakers to introduce themselves and explain how uh, are you related to internationalization uh, in higher education. And let's start from George. Hello, good morning, everyone, and thank you all for participating, and thank you for the invitation and uh, organization from Costas and from Athena European University. Uh, so I am, I have been working, um, I've been en engaged in internationalization for the past four years of my studies as an undergraduate student in HMU. Uh, I've started in ESN HMU and uh, continued with the Athena European University, which is the main initiative we are discussing for today, and uh, I have seen internationalization from different projects, and I feel very comfortable in today's meeting. Thank you, George. And the floor goes to Yasson. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you're well. Uh, thank you for the invite, uh, Mr. Costas. Uh, my name is Jason Cartalos. I, I'm an undergraduate student. I study business administration in Athens, University of Economics and Business. So it's nice to see that we have multiple backgrounds here and multiple universities. Uh, I am related with internalization because uh, I have been part of Isaac uh, exchanges as a vice president, my last role. Uh, so this lasted for about a year and a half. And also in the last semester, so the last last spring semester, I was a part of the Erasmus Plus exchange program. I went from Athens University of Economics and Business to Zagreb, Croatia, in University of Zagreb, in the Faculty of Economics and Business. And what I'm hoping to do today is provide my personal viewpoints and my personal challenges, motivations, uh, and maybe some solutions to be considered uh, from my experience in the Erasmus exchange. Thank you, Yason. And now the floor goes to Rita. Yes. Good morning, everybody. My name is Rita, and I'm currently the president of Yason. I actually have been involved in this world of internationalization since 2017, since I did my arms in Belgium uh, a long time ago. And since then, I'm joining Yason uh, locally in my section in Lisbon, and now as president of Yason uh, nowadays. Thank you, Rita. And Katerina, please introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. Um, so uh, I'm part of the Erasmus Student Network for the, I have been a part of the Erasmus Student Network for the past five years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, also last year, uh, I did my, my Erasmus Plus internship uh, in Krakow. Um, and yeah, currently I'm the president of VS in Greece. Thank you, Katerina. And uh, Tangui, the floor is yours. Hey, hi everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. My name is uh, Tangui Guibert. I'm French and vice president of ESU, the European Student Union. I started my journey in the student movement in 2016 when I was still a nurse student a really long time ago. Um, and then I was part of the National Student Union of France and my local union and uh, other student organization uh, back in France. And yeah, now vice president of uh, of ESU. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation and for that uh, discussion. Thank you very much. And the last but not the least, Zasim. Hello, uh, thank you for your invitation to this meeting. Um, so I'm Nassim, I'm a student from the University of Antwerp, and my university is part of the UFA Alliance, which is uh, Young Universities for the Future of Europe. Uh, I'm a student representative in our student body, um, and I hope that I can contribute to this conversation by sharing our experiences uh, on co-creating our own alliance. Thank you, Nassim. So thank you very much for the introduction. Um, as you can see, all of our speakers are very experienced young people. And uh, now let's start with the questions uh, that we have uh, according to their experience. So the first question goes to uh, Yason. I would like to ask you to share with us your main motivation to participate in Erasmus program. What were uh, the highlights of this experience? Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, to begin with, I think that there are multiple, multiple motivations for someone to go on an Erasmus exchange. Before I even entered uh, university, uh, I've heard about Erasmus and it was unreal to me that someone helps you, financially funds you to go on an exchange without you having to sacrifice, uh, you know, your uh, career goals, your academic goals. So uh, this is, it is a big opportunity, I think, for students. And I've spoken with dozens of students who have been on exchanges, both Erasmus exchanges and other international international exchanges. And I don't think I've ever met one that regretted it. That was like, no, I, I didn't uh, get a lot from this opportunity. So obviously, multiple, multiple motivations. Uh, for me, uh, I think the main motivations, motivations were three. Uh, first of all, the part of the academic enrichment, the fact that uh, you can combine in your studies, in your bachelor studies, you have the opportunity to go abroad for one semester or even up you, up to a year. Uh, if you wish, you don't have to sacrifice your your classes, you can match them. And this is a big 
a uh, reason why I decided to go because I wanted to see how a different university uh, operates, how it competes. I wanted to compare my university with a different university uh, abroad and to to identify the differences in the way of operation, the similarities, and why those are happening, why uh, it is important uh, to to make that to make that a thing to to, to understand it and also uh you know when you live in one country and you when you study for example for me in Athens University of Economics and Business you only see one thing you only see one way of working uh and your mind it's very hard for you to think of other things it's hard for you to think of other ways or solutions that th things could be done but when you go on a different exchange uh that becomes very apparent that becomes very clear and then you start thinking about a lot of things and a lot of lots of ways that you can then come back and improve your local community and the university life of others like uh, many institutions uh, do like ESN, for for example. Uh, so the first thing was academic enrichment. The second thing, uh, of course, it's the multicultural multicultural experience and the traveling. Of course, uh, going to Erasmus, you have the opportunity to see uh, a lot of places. You have to go. You can go to a lot of countries. Personally, I went to four different countries. Even though I was in Croatia, I also had the opportunity to go to Italy, to Slovenia, and to Hungary, which are of course very close to Croatia. Uh, and also get to meet many different people from uh, various uh, backgrounds uh, around the world. For example, my roommate in the uh, student dormitories that I was uh, located was from India, uh, which is, you know, it was something very different for me. Uh, it was, of course, very uh, culturally uh, engaging and it was great to see uh, how other people uh, view the world, how their countries uh, are operating, what are their problems, uh, and such things. Uh, and also, the third thing is it was, of course, personal development, because this experience is a transformative experience, even for the most adaptable and the most flexible uh, students. It is a transformative experience to go abroad and to live in a country. Uh, for the first time, you get to uh, stop living with your parents. You have to do your own financial budgeting. You, you have to organize your own time. You have to find your own way to, to live your life, uh, basically. And this is something that, of course, gets you out of your comfort zone. And I think it's a major benefit, you know. Uh, and so for the highlights, I would have to say that uh, it was very interesting to collaborate in team projects, team university projects. Uh, there were a lot of them and collaborating in teams of international students for like five, six or even up to seven people. Uh, it was very, very awakening. I would say it was a great experience uh, because, uh, uh, as I said before, everyone in their own university and in their own country operates yeah, or thinks in like a, a different way. So having to get that knowledge and try to uh, adapt to the project needs and communicate together in an efficient way uh, was a great it was a great challenge. And of course, uh, another highlight, as I said before, was traveling. I got to go to four countries and also I managed to go to like 18 different places in Croatia. So I'm confident that I've traveled like um, most of Croatia. And to do that, I had to push myself, uh, let's say, hard in order to to be academically responsible and to achieve good grades. But in doing so, uh, I really had the opportunity to to see many different places, many different people. And I can say for sure that it was worth it. Uh, so that's all. I hope I didn't overstep my time. No, you didn't. Okay. Thank you very much for, <laughs> for your response. I think the, the very important thing that you mentioned is uh, this opening mind, uh, given that the whole world may be uh, recognized on the internet, taking advantage of life experience um, still is still very, very enriching. Thank you very much. So let's go with another question, which goes to the Tangui. Uh, um, how student can exploit during uh, her or his professional development in internationalization experience? What are the actions uh, of the European Student Union for more international university studies? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the questions. And I mean, uh, I've prepared some stuff, but I think that I will start from what Shasan said, because it's really interesting and it's core. I mean, it's really what what the students want to experience during the mobility is exactly what will uh, gain from 
for them when they will enter the markets, uh, the 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 job market, because. I mean, what he said about learning about other people and learning about other culture, it's exactly what is the main benefit from doing uh, mobility. Because, for example, when you do your, because mobility is mainly in bachelor and master degree. And for example, if you want to make like a PhD or if you want to work in research um, or even if you want to go work in a company, or I mean, even in any field, I mean, even in health. Uh, and it's, that's also really important. I mean, to learn other way to, uh, to see, um, to see how to cure people and how to uh, approach our system and, and stuff. And for the research, it's also really important because I mean, it's always there is always a time uh, when you have to learn about other culture and uh, how the other people are working, their working style, and it's also coming a lot from the cultural uh, approach of education and stuff. And so when you uh, perform a mobility and when you have the chance to go on mobility, um, you um, are more able to more quickly uh, go through these all these differences and say, okay, so now we maybe do not have the same approach on this, but that's okay because I mean everyone know how uh, how to work and how to um, evolve with people with other cultural backgrounds, and now they are like they gain in uh, efficiency in um, working together and uh, yeah and yeah advancing with um, with discovering each other to be. Um, more uh, effective in the creation of uh, something something uh, uh, I lost the words um, like a more like a group and to create a group and uh, the spirit of working together that, that's really helpful uh, I would say that it's the main thing that from what Yasan said uh, on how we can uh, on how mobility can really be um, favorable for for students when they enter the job market because they yeah, say they they uh, are already already used to um, used to uh, other cultures and on what um, Ezu is doing for more international university studies. I mean, a lot of things. Um, I mean, we are um, mainly working on uh, working on the barriers um, that prevent students to go on mobility, um, and for that we are uh, we are working in a, in a lot of areas, working with um, mainly with the European Commission, European Parliament, uh, and also other stakeholders. <clears throat> at European level on how we can tackle the, the, the main barriers for student to go on mobility. And there are, there are several, I will um, just name some of them, but uh, first of all, the problem of uh, lacking of budget and means meaning that maybe not uh, all the students can afford mobility because as also Yasen said, I mean, it costs a lot to go on mobility and if there is no uh, financial uh, help, it uh, can create also like a gap for some students to know, uh, not go. There is also the problem of recognition uh, because uh, still too many students can't go on mobility, I mean, can go on mobility, but then what about if your mobility was not uh, in the end recognized and all your skills and competencies are not recognized? And that's a big problem because, I mean, it's not about uh, going abroad for one year to do whatever you want. It's about going abroad and then have all your um, everything that you learn recognized in your own country so you can pursue your, uh, your, your curricula. And there is also the problem of the lacking of information before you go, when you go, and after you go. And for that, I mean, it's uh, about a lot of things. I mean, your uh, own uh, registration and involvement in the mobility, the request of the grant, and also all the information about the services you can have access to um, when you when you are abroad. And uh, also the problem of language uh, for, uh, for example, if you go, I don't know, to, um, let's say Poland and if you're not speaking Polish and there is not a lot of people speaking English around you uh, that's also a problem because you are um, not maybe uh, able to uh, to go uh, and to exchange with a lot of people so it's restrained also the 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 number of people you can uh, exchange with so we are working on uh, on everything uh, on all these barriers and how we can uh, tackle them especially yeah as i said with uh, with the with the commission in several working groups um and with uh, different partners so uh, to to make uh, in the end mobility more uh, more affordable more inclusive for everyone uh, yeah that's uh, 
I would say that that's the main idea, but I, I'm really generally not good for managing my time, so I, that's why I don't want to take that um, that much of the time. Uh, but yeah, that that's the main idea of uh, of what we're doing, and just um, um, finishing by uh, of course talking about the European universities as uh, we're invited by uh, mainly by the initiative of uh, Athena Alliance. Um, we, we see we really see in the European universities like an opportunity to tackle all these problems. And to really go further uh, on for what concerns mobility, because I mean we are talking about higher education institutions roughly closer together, so that, I mean it will be easier to eventually uh, straighten some tie and straighten some um, some connections between the higher education institutions to eventually make the whole processes um, more um, more easy to use, more user friendly for the students, and when it uh, comes for example to recognition to through the learning agreement maybe to have something that uh, can allow at the end uh, some kind of automatic recognition at the end or maybe to um, ease the process of uh, registration and to, for the request of the grants etc so i mean we really see uh, within the european universities like a tool to maybe tackle all the barriers that i mentioned and so yes that's also a huge part of our work and how we can um, eventually uh, use uh, and for the mobility within the alliances uh, and yeah that's uh, also a, a point that I wanted to mention because uh, that's really important uh, for us. Thank you very much again and I hope that was not too long. Oh it was actually a little bit but we are still in time so don't worry. <laughs> so I think the the, the, the thing that um, um, that is very important in what you said that despite of the generation of you students uh, that is described as not caring about any relationships between people uh, you also did focus on the experience of meeting real people and uh, have life experience as very very enriching and that's nice i think and okay so thank you and let's go to um, uh, another question uh, which goes to katerina can you please tell us what are the main challenges for incoming students? Uh, what do they face? What what challenges? And how does the SN facilitate their experience in okay. host uh, can you institutions? Hear me? Because my internet connection is unstable. Okay, perfect. we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay perfect. Uh, so, uh, from my point of view, uh, the main challenges that the incoming students are facing are the accommodation. So, where to find a place to stay. Um, and secondly, the language barrier. Uh, so for the first one, um, a lot of Erasmus students in I can hear you. Katerina, maybe I will suggest you to turn off your camera. Maybe it will uh, make your connection better. So we can't hear you at all, I think. Katerina disconnected. So, uh, oh, you are you are back with us. Maybe you you should turn off your camera to make the connection better. She's still not here. Are you with us? No, she's out. She's going okay. to back, but you can go on with the next one, and then I'm going to accommodate. We will. So, uh, the next question that we have prepared is uh, to Rita. And Rita, can you please tell us what is uh, the vision of the ESN International for more internationalized uh, higher education? What is the role of the ESN International, ESN International or to higher education decision makers for more internationalization? Katerina is back, however. Katerina, if you would like to switch off your camera in order to make your statements. Sorry, Rita, for this intervention. So, Katerina. Yeah, I'm really sorry. Now I'm using my data, so I think it will go better. But anyways, so uh, what I was talking about is that uh, the, main, the, main, the two main challenges I can see is the language barrier and accommodation. People don't know where to find the accommodation. Uh, incoming student and outgoing Erasmus student are keep uh, asking us. Uh, about the place that they can find um, th their home if we know if there are specific guidelines where can we find um, a website for example that there will be no scammers etc and the second one is the 
as already said, there is the language barrier. Sometimes they cannot find specific courses in English. Uh, in Greece, for example, in my university at least, we don't have a lot of them. So some of them, are, some of the classes are in Greek and their, their Erasmus students are blended with the Greek students. And especially when it comes to a specific terminology, it's super difficult for us, uh, the Greek students, to translate to the Erasmus students uh, what's happening. Because, yeah, we have done, all, <laughs> you have done this too. Um, so, yeah. And what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry, uh, because of the of the terrible uh, uh, connection, I lost it. Okay. Uh, how does CSN facilitate their experience in host institutions? Okay, so basically, I, I could uh, split this in two categories, let's say, the local level and the national level. From the local level, we, you know that uh, we as ESN, we support uh, the um, Erasmus offices with the bureaucracy um, staff, with the Erasmus students. We try to help them. We organize events. And also, we are trying to be uh, as close as possible to these people. And from the national level's point of view, um, we try to create more partnerships connected to the things that I have already said, for example, about accommodation, where to find specific places and specific partnerships to support the students to find um, their home. Also, we advocate about this uh, with uh, the in the higher institutions and with the national agencies, we're trying to uh, promote as much as we can mobility to, to underline all these problems and find solutions. Also, we educate our volunteers in order to be more ready, let's say, and capable to support their Erasmus students in the local level. And of course, um, so, oh yeah, so that's it, that's it. Because I think I have passed the five minutes, so I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think the very important thing that you said is uh, are the uh, organizational barriers, not due to the motivation of the students, but due to the preparation of universities themselves for students' uh, exchange. So let's go back to Rita. Would you like me to repeat the question? No, it's okay. Thank you. And I'm going to, of course, continue a bit what uh, Katarina is saying, because we are from the same organization, of course, from different points of view, but I'm going to give a bit of continuity for what she's saying. And in ESN, especially in international level, and of course, all abroad of ESN, what we try to do is to promote more and better mobility for students. And what we try to do with this is, by this, it's to have more access to mobility opportunities and more impact in the actions that we that we do. With more access to mobility opportunities, we are saying that, for example, with our advocacy campaigns, now a bit more specific for the international level, we try, for example, to liaise with the European Commission to try to have more opportunities for students to go on mobility opportunities. But also we try, for example, with the events that Ina was mentioned, to have more impact in society. And also was mentioned here prior to the panel of the connections between uh, the alliances and the local the local community. Also, it's something that we, uh, we strive to do uh, with, our, with our actions. Uh, but for this, uh, ESN has been actually advocating for, for many things all over the years. But one of the things that we have been advocating um, and also we have been continuing, continuing doing, especially now with the learning mobility framework, it's been one of the, our main uh, targets with this was actually the mobility target. So we believe that students actually uh, should have an opportunity to go on mobility. And we believe that yearly we should... Um, have a target of 25% of higher education students participating in mobility because we see, of course, as, as was mentioned here uh, in the first intervention, all the opportunities that gives to a young person to go on mobility. I also faced it myself when I went to 2017. The opportunity is not only to enrich your CV, but also to enrich your professional uh, and personal path and to travel and, and discover and discover the world. That's why we highly advocate for this uh, 25 mobility targets. Uh, and of course, the, the role of ESN, it's a bit double-faced. So we are present in three levels. And uh, like Katrina was, was mentioning, we are representing the grassroots. So trying to support the students by organizing events, by integrating them in the, in the society. But also a bit my role in ESN International is to take a bit what the grassroots is doing and explaining the problems of the students to the stakeholders, such as universities, such as national agencies, such as the commission. And for this, for example, we are a big fan of data and of data collection. And for example, we have done with, with ESU uh, 
a survey about housing, uh, understanding a bit what are the problems with housing that the students are facing. And we have now, for example, just concluded our big survey. So we organized a survey between two years called Yes and Survey, where we collected more or less 23k of answers of the challenges that the students are facing throughout the mobility opportunities. And the two main challenges that uh, were tackled in the survey that were already tackled here were lack of funding and lack of affordable accommodation. And as you can see, they are a bit both, both connected. And this goes a bit to the second part of, of the question, is that how can we, can we find uh, solutions for, for these problems? So to find solutions for, for these problems, uh, actually it needs to be a, um, um, a, co a cohesion of, of the two sides. So it's not only the, the higher education institutions and the government that need to work together, but also we as student organizations need to support with information and to the provision of information. So I will say so that's, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, your approach to collecting students' mobility data is impressive, and I wish you were able to use the, those data to collect uh, that 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 uh, that that you are collecting to achieve the the level of mobility uh, you are planning to achieve. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the next question uh, goes to uh, George. Are you with us? Yes, you are with us. Yeah. Uh, what is the role and engagement of the students in European University Alliance? Please provide some examples from the alliance that you are in. Carolina, in this point, I'd like to say that this question also refers to Nassim, George and Nassim. Yes. Uh, let, let, let me repeat it for Nassim, just to be sure that he heard. Okay. All right, so the European Universities Initiative uh, provide a new, new opportunities for mobility for students, and not only mobilities, but opportunities for their professional career development. Because now, outside of graduating from one university, you graduate from nine or 10 or even more in some cases, and you have a bigger network of students, a bigger network of professors, a bigger network of companies that are collaborating through university, and you have bigger opportunities. So in the whole idea of the European Universities Initiative upgrades your university experience. Outside of that, students play a major role in the European Universities Initiative uh, because as instructed by the European Commission, Euro students should be the center point of this initiative in the student center approach and student center approach to education. So uh, what we are trying to organize is actions that really engage students. So. In the past years, we have tried to onboard students, both from ESN, both from ESU, both from different backgrounds, in order to have their opinion heard. Outside of that, we also try to uh, hear and communicate with local governments to see what they need from the universities in order to facilitate that in the future. So, for example, if a local government or a local community in the city needs a specific course in uh, anything that we are, we can help as a university, we can organize this. And this doesn't mean it can be organized just from our university, because as I mentioned before, you create a consortium of universities, you create multiple opportunities that can that you can mitigate the uh, the workload into many different partners. So that's one of the good things. And another really good uh, benefit of the European Universities Initiative is definitely the blended intensive courses because now students do not really have to just go for a full Erasmus for six months. They can really just take an exchange for a week or two and do some work online and still get what the experience of what Erasmus is, but in a shorter period. And at the same time, we also facilitate events. Uh, social events for those students that are coming for those blended uh, activities uh, in order to feel more welcome and to get the full Erasmus experience in those days. So similar to how a welcome week structures in uh, in a university, in ESN. So we do this even for an event that's, for example, six days, like we can organize more, even for events social that will make those students feel welcome and embedded in the society, which is, it was one of the faults that Blended have, had before because students just went there and they didn't really get embedded in the society. Uh, outside of that, we also organize courses to facilitate further training for the students. This could mean career opportunities, 
uh, this could mean uh, body systems. So for example, to create a sense of community with students being from so different campus and that are very remote and probably will not meet to together so easily as you would with someone from your own university, we organize uh, an online body system where you can be matched with students from your university in order to participate. And as I said before, the student council and the student government is uh, here in the European in the European University with participation from over fifty students at this moment. So all the students have the ability to voice their needs and their wants, and they can, will be transferred directly to the governance of the alliance in order to be facilitated. Thank you. So uh, together with George, we participated in the event of, for the establishment of ESN Athena, and we both know uh, what uh, energy uh, is in student. And uh, I think it is our responsibility to wisely support your initiative and not to not to fail this energy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, like as you both might remember, like we Carolina organized the event of ESN Athena, and we had. Uh, a really incredible initiative where almost 40 or almost 25 30 I, I don't remember the exact number students uh, came to Lublin the European youth capital and they received training uh, on different matters that could help him who, who could help them in their betterment of their careers and to better facilitate and coordinate the Athena student board in the future Okay, so thank you very much for the answer. Uh, well, as Costas mentioned, who is always watches over and um, uh, well, he takes care about everything we have um, uh, around our uh, our guests, our speakers, uh, the representative of uh, another uh, European University Alliance, and Nassim. Uh, the the same question goes to you. Would you like me to repeat it? Yes, please. <laughs> Uh, what is the role and engagement of the students in European University Alliance? Provide, please provide some examples from your alliance. Okay, um, so in the UFA Alliance, we have a student body. It's called the Student Forum. And there we have three students from each partner university. Uh, we have 10 universities in our alliance. So that's 30 students in total, three from each. Um, we get elected or uh, selected, depending on the university, uh, to represent our students in the student body. Uh, within our student body, we have a board which uh, has a president, a vice president, and a secretary. The president and the vice president also have a seat in our uh, strategic council, which is our highest governance body, which is where our rectors of the different universities are as well. And um, all votes there are unanimous, so the students have a veto in this uh, body. So through this way, we have direct say in what is decided in our alliance. Um, besides that, uh, each student of the student body is also part of a work package, which is uh, all the topics that our alliance works on. So we have various uh, topics like the student journey, which is um, what we offer to our students. So that's offering the possibilities to our students to take classes from various universities, both on-site or online. Besides that, we also have other topics like diversity and inclusion, quality insurance, um, environment, et cetera. And students have a say in each part of our um, alliance. So when proposals are made in these different work packages, they eventually end up at the highest governance body, but students will have a say in these proposals from the beginning to the end. Um, we also have the power as the student uh, forum to come up with our own proposals independently of uh, the work packages, which is where we work with staff members. Um, I think some good examples are um, some proposals that we have made to improve our campaigning towards our own students to promote uh, the alliance as a whole. Um, besides that, we have also made a lot of uh, comments about finances, which is, has been mentioned by the other speakers here as well. Um, because the UFA Alliance wants to create a UFA Bachelor. So in this Bachelor, students would go on exchange each year, so uh, three times. Um, and this would be done with uh, Erasmus Fund. Um, but I think we all know that the Erasmus Fund is not enough for all students to actually afford to go on exchange for 
um, a certain amount of time. So we have uh, very much uh, made clear to uh, our staff members and our rectors that it's really important to pay attention to these finances because um, otherwise we will only be offering mobilization for uh, mobility for uh, students of certain backgrounds. Um, so I think it's really important for us to pay attention to that as a whole. Um, yeah, we currently in our student body have a few uh, topics that are being discussed, uh, which one of them is uh, communications, which is which uh, which is what I'm focusing on. That's also why I am here today to represent our alliance. Um, so we also want to improve our uh, connection to other students from other alliances, um, because students from other alliances face similar issues that we do, and we would like to be able to discuss with them um, how they are dealing with these problems and how they are trying to solve them. So uh, we as students can come together and share ideas with each other. Uh, besides that, um, we also have a very big topic of uh, remuneration uh, for students that um, work for the Youth Alliance like me. I'm a student representative. A lot of time uh, goes to representing our students. Um, but there's uh, very little recognition for the work that we do. And uh, it's really important for the students to get recognized for the work that we do because we do contribute a lot to the project as a whole because we are part of all the levels of our alliance. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, largely uh, how the UFA Alliance deals with uh, student-centeredness. Okay, thank you. Well, as you can see, we have a great deal of experience and maybe another step to support a student could be a platform for cooperation between representatives of each university alliance to, to, to share your uh, challenges and uh, experience as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you for uh, for all the, the answers. Um, I have another question for all of you. So um, all of the speakers are asked to be focused now and hear the, the, what the question is. I would like to, to ask you to name the biggest challenge you've faced. Uh, please make one propo proposal on how to address this challenge. What does the future hold for the internationalization of higher education? And uh, let's start from George. George is... Yes. So uh, there are a lot of challenges that we have faced in uh, internationalization and uh, what does the future, the future for internationalization holds uh, a, a lot more initiatives like the European Universities Initiative. And I think uh, also the advancement and the betterment of the European Universities Initiative will play a major role in the future of internationalization both in Europe and outside of Europe because it would be a, as a placeholder of an initiative that we have uh, as a European Union. Okay, thank you. And the same question goes to Yason. Would you like me to repeat? No, no, it, it, it's okay, it's okay. Uh... As George said, there are actually many challenges uh, ongoing, uh, both from, you know, challenges that uh, student, uh, organizations like ESN and institutions like the universities uh, have to face. There are multiple challenges, but also there are challenges uh, for the students themselves that go on exchanges. I'm going to focus on that part, on the students part, being as I was an exchange participant uh, last semester. So... Uh, there are, of course, multiple challenges. Uh, you have, for example, the part of the adaptation to a new country, which is, of course, normal. Uh, something that really helped uh, in my case is that the university, the hosting university, had prepared uh, one week prior to the beginning of the semester an orientation, so-called week, uh, which is very helpful for the students to go one week earlier uh, for their semester and, you know, uh, see their accommodation, get settled down, find where you can eat, when you can wash your clothes and practical things like that. Uh, also, there is the part of the networking, uh, which is, you know, very, uh, an important issue because, you know, you, you go on an exchange abroad, you probably don't know uh, anywhere there. 
and ESN actually really helped with this challenge and it was very engaging and really enhanced the experience of the participants because it created networking events, it created uh, you know small trips and that really contributed I think to everyone's experience in uh, my case, in my exchange. Uh, the thing also that I think is one of the biggest challenges for students uh, is trying to find in the beginning prior to the exchange, trying to find a suitable university for you to go to. So the process of matching the courses that you want to, to match and collect the CTS points available, this for me and also I think for other people that I've spoken to, this was a really hard process. And also there are multiple people uh, that I know that you know, they lost their ex the opportunity to go on an exchange just because they didn't, they did not have the time uh, to to complete that process uh, within the require required deadlines. And so, uh, one solution for that, uh, because also it's different for its university. You know, maybe it's easier for universities like business administration universities because there are mul multiple faculties in this. But also for universities like law related universities or engineering universities or IT departments, uh, it's much harder to find uh, matching courses to to collect your ECTS points. And so for that, I think a decent proposal would be for the IR offices to communicate with each other from the sending and hosting institutions and to find a way to have a list with all the available courses so that there are no miscommunication and no mishaps uh, with the matching. So for example, as Katerina mentioned, uh, there were cases that which is inconceivable if you think about it that incoming students arrive in Greece and have to attend uh, courses in Greek which is you know <laughs> it sounds unreal uh, so in order to upscale the process uh, for the students but also for the universities themselves of uh, finding the suitable courses there should be a list of the available courses that you have to take for its, univer for its university uh, so that is one I think a big challenge and also already mentioned again Katerina, but accommodation, I think, is another thing that really uh, frustrates uh, all students. And it is also one of the biggest bottlenecks when going on an exchange. For me personally, uh, University of Zagreb really made it extremely easy. And it was really helpful because they provided a list of potential dormitories when you could be hosted. And this was accompanied in the original application to go on Erasmus, which was really helpful. And it was actually one of the reasons why I chose, along with other students, this university, because I had the accommodation problem, one of the biggest problems, settled, settled out from the beginning. So uh, I don't think that it is ESN's responsibility to try to help incoming or outgoing students to find accommodation. I think it is the university's responsibility to to provide lists uh, with websites and actual resources uh, to help the students find their accommodation and uh, preferably the most uh, financially, you know, uh, appropriate accommodations as well, because we're students and as already mentioned, the financial motivations, even though exist, they are most many of the times not enough for students to, to go on an exchange. So that's all for me. Thank you very much. Uh, well, um, meanwhile, as we are slowly approaching to the end of the first part, I encourage you to ask questions in the chat. And uh, let's continue with the same question uh, to Rita. Yes, actually, I yes, told everything that I wanted to say, but I'll focus mainly on four challenges. This was the one that the students actually told us that they were the biggest challenge that they were facing. The first one is the one that was already tackled here, accommodation. And actually, in the survey that we did with ESU, we understood that, of course, that if the university can provide accommodation, student dorms, it would be better for students. But actually, what we understood is actually what was said before. So if actually the universities can provide a list of uh, accommodation options, the students really value uh, this effort from the university. So, for example, we compared the case of Italy and Netherlands. Italy university don't have student dorms and also don't compile this information for students, but the Netherlands compile this information for students. And we understand that actually students really value that the university is even making an effort to, to give them the, these options. Also, the, the other problem, of course, is lack of funding. And one of the things that the SN has been advocating for a lot of years is the increase of grants, especially the green top up. 
So we understand that the students want to travel more sustainably, but they don't have the means to do it, especially because green top up is not enough for, for the traveling of sustainable travel. And actually we understood that the preferred method of transportation of students is still plain all over the world, uh, not only in Greece, but all over the world is still plain. So we see that actually uh, it needs to be an increase um, in order for the students to, to, to prefer travel in this more sustainable methods of transportation. But also, other or of other challenge that we have been seeing regarding uh, funding, it's uh, regarding the timing of the grants. So, for example, for students to go on mobility, they need to receive the grants in time. They need to receive the grants before they go on mobility, especially if they have fewer opportunities. It's, it's completely crucial. And we still, okay, we have seen some improvements regarding the other survey we did two years ago, but we still see that there are still some challenges, especially in some universities, to actually provide the grants on time uh, to students to go on mobility. Um, and I would say the third big challenge, of course, is recognition of credits already tackled here. Uh, and I know that universities don't have a very big role. This is a more state role uh, to, to implement uh, this, this priority, but it's completely crucial, uh, especially about the matching courses and students to go on mobility and be ensured that they actually, when they go back, they, they have the courses recognized. And actually, I can say it was my, my biggest problem when I was an Erasmus student. I went I went to Erasmus in Belgium. It was in EU. It was not even outside of EU. And I had a lot of problems recognizing my credits when I, when I went back. So we can see that even now in the new program, there is still challenges regarding, regarding this matter. And I conclude. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Katarina? Oh my God, they said everything I wanted to say about the challenges. <laughs> Uh, especially Rita and Yasun, they covered me up. But uh, I just wanted to say something about the future of the inter internationalization of education. To be honest, I would like to see in some years through the Erasmus app, uh, uh, the Erasmus Plus app, to be able to create the whole application for your studies, to, to, to choose all your courses from there. I know that this is probably the main point of the application uh, after some years and development. But yeah, I would like to see a platform finally uh, that will help us find the our university, maybe our industry uh, more easily. And this is from my point of view. Thank you very much. And Tangui? Um, can I say something before? But just one sentence, George. Yes, yes. Uh, I think for internships, uh, the European Universities Initiative will be able to help by organize, uh, by gathering all the available internships that are from universities. So I think also Kenderina in, inside of the app, the European Universities would also have an advantage with this by facilitating such internship mobilities. Okay, thank you. And let's go to Tangui. Thank you. Uh, indeed, complicated to pass the, uh, the last one, um, but I agree with everything that was um, that was said. I will try to to bring something new, um, and it's um, something about student participation uh, and especially student participation um, in the governance of uh, of the Erasmus uh, programs and in the Erasmus national agencies and even at the scale of higher education institutions or at the alliance as well. Um, because um, I mean, it's really interesting to talk about how students, uh, what are the problems of students and everything. And I mean, of all the things that uh, we all do uh, as student organization, but at some point it's also uh, necessary to have the student at the table of decisions to also bring these issues directly where the decisions are taken. And there is um, a, a huge thing about uh, having students uh, involved in the process uh, of decisions or where the funds are allocated, uh, at least in the national agencies. I know that these discussions can also ha happen at higher education institutions, even more now with the alliances, uh, because I'm sorry for the background now. Um, and yeah, so I mean, it's really important to have uh, elected, uh, democratically elected students representative in uh, the table of decisions for what regards mobility, uh, because it's really where we can make the difference. So, I mean, it's more a call to the universities that are here uh, that invite students to the decision, uh, invite the students to the table of decision because it's uh, 
uh, it will it will gain for for everyone. I mean, even the universities will uh, be more close to the to the needs of students, and that's also a way to have maybe more students to go on mobility and to enhance the mobility of students. I mean, if we want to reach uh, all these targets of 20, 25 percent of mobility, I mean, we have to have a mobility uh, curricula that are close to student needs, and for that we need the students at the table of decision. That uh, it's, so yeah, that would be my 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 uh, my proposal. Oh, it's uh, the end of the front table. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. And Nassim, you have the hardest task because everything is said already. <laughs> I also very much agree with everything that has been said so far. I think another challenge that has not been mentioned yet and I think is often overseen um, is uh, diversity in the future of Europe. Uh, um, young people in Europe are more and more diverse. Are our students are more and more diverse. And I think it's really important for the future of Europe and for democracy to keep in mind that this um, diversity also comes with challenges. I think uh, a lot of people, uh, students uh, from different backgrounds don't necessarily feel represented by their own institutions um, and also not in the curriculum. So I think a really important challenge for the future is to pay attention to the curriculum and see how we can include all students in this curriculum. I think it's also really important to keep in mind that um, the exchanges and the Erasmus program uh, contribute to a common European identity, which is really important for uh, our international future. Um, but at the same time, I also think we need to um, help build civilians that are also more aware of the entire world. I think when we look at the current uh, events that are going on in the world, we have seen a lot of um, different opinions and we have seen that countries across the world that are less democratic are changing their stances. And I think it's really important that people understand where all of this is coming from. And I think for democracy and the future of Europe, it's really important that our students and the next generation of um, civilians um, have, have the feeling that what they feel and what they think is also heard and said uh, in our institutions. Thank you, Nassim, for your impact. We have another student um, already growth, the Costas. Put the floor goes to you. I would like I to ask to... a question. So I would like I would like to take time in the in the queue. <laughs> okay, but you know I have another I have a just another question which is very important from my point of view as a Erasmus Plus office representative. Um, at many European universities, we can observe the decreasing number of student mobilities. Uh, we all know what are the opportunities, but what stops students? Uh, how shall university staff communicate with students to encourage them for their mobilities? And let's start uh, from Nassim to make things uh, easier for... Could you repeat the question, please? Uh, what stops students? Why students don't want to um, use the mobilities? And how shall university staff communicate uh, with students to encourage them to, to, to make the mobilities? I think a big challenge here is that going on mobility um, requires a lot of uh, administrative work for students. Um, you need to apply, you need to write motivation letters, and then when you get selected and appointed to a destination, you also still have to find your housing, um, make sure that you have um, health insurance, et cetera, et cetera. And I think um, all of that can be very intimidating to a lot of students, um, especially because all of this is abroad. For some students, it will be the first time that they will be living without their parents. Um, so I think um, there just needs to be more support and clearer information uh, in a more condensed way, I think, because the information is very much available, but in very large texts that students need to go through. So I, I just think it needs to be uh, more simplified and more straightforward for students to um, overcome this barrier. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, on your hand is right. So, okay. <laughs> Maybe yes. let's start. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, can I start, or do you want yes, to pass yes, it to? Please, okay, go ahead. Okay, so uh, I completely agree uh, with what was just said. Uh, the process needs to be simpler. It needs to be less intimidating for students in order for them to try to to 
to start uh, basically the process of their Erasmus mobility. And also I would say that the process needs to be more consistent. You know, people join the universities, maybe one year passes, maybe two years passes, maybe even three. And, you know, they know that there is an Erasmus program somewhere. They do not know when it starts, when they can go. They do not know when the applications are on. You know, there are students, for example, that are starting their, uh, or actually they're finishing their third year, for example. And they must have already uh, done the application and been accepted for the next semester or the two semesters uh, later. So they're not aware of it. And so having a consistent uh, information uh, system for to, to get to the students, because the information exists, but it's really hard uh, to, to, to get to it. It's not approachable for students. Not, not many students will go to their university's web, website, go through all materials and find the Erasmus uh, information needed. So the information needs to get to them in a more simplified and and easy to understand way. So that's what I would say. Thank you very much, Rita. Yes, I'm just going to back it up with what's been said. So what students actually need and what's the information that gives to us is that they, in the pre-departure support, they want the information in all in one place. They want the information all centralized in one place. And especially here now speaking more about digitalization and what Katerina also mentioned, not only about the Erasmus Plus app, but also about the Erasmus without papers. So we are seeing now, of course, that it's been some troubles in implement, implementation of Erasmus without papers project, but we want to see now and ESN is going to start to work more uh, on this. Uh, this project to face more the students' needs. And so it's important that face the university needs, but it's also important to face the student needs. And we have been seeing now that, of course, the universities are central in this project, but the student needs in this project are not being well addressed, in our opinion. So we are knowing now starting to liaise uh, more uh, regarding uh, this project and the centralization of the services for the application period uh, for the students. Thank you very much. And George? Yeah, so I think the main challenge that students face that uh, makes them defer and not want to continue their application or not to even try is a very, it still has a very big chain of communication in order to be able and choose what, where you want to go to Erasmus. So you first have to find courses and recognize them and discuss them with the coordinator and then rediscuss the courses if they can be taken. And then all this puts a lot of effort in the students um, and some of them may not want to do it. And while this could take a lot of time because in replying to emails and, for example, a coordinator can take a week and then you have to get back and find other courses and then you have to re-verify if those courses are well and they have to... So this creates a, a huge confusion for the students and uh, it really deters them to try and to continue or some not even may find the, the application complete within the deadline they need to be nominated. So I think that's one of the initial challenges that students face. Then there's of course the challenges that we have already discussed, like for example, uh, the housing, the cost, uh, the, the sponsorship money, and if they, will if they will be able to qualify for the additional funding, some of that will help them. But still, I think the, the, the initial problem that they face is the courses because most of them do not really want to go to a mobility if they will lose in a semester of academic courses because at the end of the day, they cannot afford it. So I think that's the main challenge. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, now let's go to the questions. Uh, Kostas, are you going to be first or we are giving the floor mm -hmm. for, I don't know what's your name, you are signed like Ogaret. Hey, Gareth. I will okay. be there. Okay. Thank you. I, I apologize for interrupting, but I'm going to brief two departments on Erasmus now, the new students. And I want I wanted to thank the students and the organizers for giving us their view of what is going on. But it's so important to remember as we progress in our career that we're here for the students. In my opinion, the biggest problem is accommodation, especially here on Crete and with Airbnb in the whole of Europe is getting worse. And I make no secret of the fact that we could not cope with helping Erasmus with accommodation if, it, if ESN were not helping us. The universities need to provide more accommodation. And in the last three years, we are better organized than we were, but there's always room for improvement. And I agree that we need to be even better organized. And I hope in the next three years, 
and within the Athena University, which is a positive goal that we can aim towards, that we will get even better organised in coping with the Erasmus. I had to go and brief two departments now, so I wanted to thank the students for giving me uh, some energy to go and speak to the people in their first semester. Okay, thanks very much for the meeting. Bye bye. Thank you. Costas, now it's your turn. No, we, as you know, an organizer, I suspect that I should be the last one to provide the floor to the other people. I will wait. Okay, so no, no. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, Thank you very much to the big group of motivated students that we have with us. This is really critical. And my question is regards to this, because here at the Polytechnic of Porto, uh, um, it's been a bit tough to get motivated students to be involved in Athena activities in these European universities initiatives. So my question goes directly to the students that are with us. What is your driving force? Why are you participating in such an active way in these initiatives on top of uh, what you already have from academic activities and social and all of that? I would like to know that because maybe we can somehow explore this to somehow attract more students from the Polytechnic to join us. So I suspect that uh, Nassim and Yorgos can answer this question, eh? that they participate yes, in the yes, first yes, Indeed, indeed. So the question. Um, so me personally, I think it's really important to work on uh, interna internationalization. And that's why I started working with UFE within my own university. Um, but I uh, see a similar issue as um, you said you have in, in Portugal, uh, that students over here are not super interested in um, the whole international project and we're also trying to figure out what exactly makes it so that students um, lack this interest and um, we also haven't really figured out exactly what makes it so that so little students are involved in all of the activities that our alliance offers because we also have a very huge uh, palette of things that students can do from language courses to um, civil activities etc um, so I think it's overall um, just so that students, especially after the pandemic, kind of uh, started uh, separating their social life from their university life and academic life. And because of that, I think they're uh, looking less towards their own universities for activities outside of their curriculum. And I just think it's a very important communication task to uh, draw the attention of students, because I think that what we are offering actually can uh, interest students. I just think we are not um, sufficiently reaching our students and informing them about what the possibilities are. Yes, I also completely agree with Nassim. To be honest, I think the main issue is communication issues because uh, just publishing it on main channels or sending it to the emails will not reach the students that we want. And there are a lot of student societies that could help us with that or having ambassadors in the class or whatever is possible in order to facilitate the information reaching uh, all the students or as many students as possible. Because I think uh, because we, European universities, for example, tend to have an audience of students in the thousands, I don't think it's uh, as effective as it is as it would have been by sending an email for your university for your action because you create an action that really you depend on the on to be notified by thousands of students and i think you tend to need to have a more traditional approach from, from mouth to mouth and from classrooms and i think you need a lot of help in order to facilitate the information reaching where we need to where it needs to be. I think that's the first issue. I also I agree with Nassim that some of the students try to split their academic lives with their extracurriculars. So most of them are not really looking for any academic extracurriculars after COVID time. But I think I still think there is a lot of percentage of students that really are interested in those actions. But I think they just don't get the information at the right time or they don't get the information well. Like they receive it as an email but they might not open the email in time for the for the event or they might not open the email or not receive the information from the main channels of its alliance or its universities because most of them really will not really go looking for those information they, they will just expect it to reach it to them 
So I think this could be resolved by having an extended network of people that will disseminate the information and the opportunities within its university and from mouth to mouth in a more traditional way. I also think what might be important to add to this is that a lot of students um, are very busy because of their curriculum and they're not really willing to add a lot of work that is also academic after their hours already. Uh, so I also think um, you can definitely reach more students by making activities intracurricular and by finding ways to recognize the work that students do uh, within the Alliance, um, whether it's academic courses or other activities as part of their curriculum, um, as different ways of learning. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Carolina, I don't know if I can add something. Yes, I'm uh, going to you, straight to you. <laughs> but because I'm also Portuguese and I know very well the, the reality of the Portuguese universities. Of course, I don't know the technical support for reality because I studied in Lisbon. But one thing that I noticed, especially by dealing with, with Portuguese universities for five years, is that is exactly what was mentioned here is the problem of recognition of activities, of volunteer activities, so especially not student unions, but more the other volunteer activities, especially yes, and activities and European University activities. So, for example, one of the things that I noticed is that my volunteers wanted to go to a, an event, for example, a capacity building event that they wanted to be trained how to be, for example, about European elections, about how to be better leaders for society. And the universities in Portugal didn't recognize the, the activities, didn't let them to skip exams or to to skip classes to, to attend these activities. So I would say the recognition of volunteer activities is, is, is core for, for this. And I would say also the peer-to-peer the peer, the peer, the peer -peer support, like you always mentioned. So not only receiving the information by email, but also uh, these activities that the sections organize of going uh, to the students and explain, I did mobility. And this was uh, what I learned with my mobility experience, actually having this physical interaction with the, with the students, uh, it's, it's key. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tangui. My, yeah, thank you very much. My point was the one that Rita just made about the recognition of the uh, engagement of the students who are uh, part of the, uh, of this, um, of this initiative. I mean, if, especially when it comes to, I mean, because the topic is the European universities, I mean, when you are involved and you, uh, no, no, you rightly said that when you have to pile up like your personal life, your curriculum life, your in your life of student representative and all the other activities that you may have, and you are doing that basically for free when you are contributing to the activity and the life of the Alliance, it's some kind of unfairness with all the other person who are uh, directly employed to do that job. So at least to have some kind of recognition or at least maybe some kind of arrangement of the classes that, for example, that you are able to miss some classes or you have some uh, special exams, uh, delayed exams, like that th things that make your life easier and that uh, give you time to uh, allow yourself. Because I mean, probably there would be a lot of students that would be uh, really keen to involve themselves in this kind of initiative, but they do not have the, the mean to do that. Uh, and they, they can't allow them to do that because I mean, they do not have the time or capacity to do this. So, I mean, as soon as you uh, create some kind of exceptions like this, I mean, it's really raise the involvement rates uh, of, of students. But uh, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. And the floor goes to Fabian. Fabian. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here. And um, I want to thank um, Costas for involving me in this program. Um, uh, for over two years, uh, I think we, we are um, part of the program, but unfortunately we don't get information on the call. And so how do we get calls for the students to be involved? This is a problem to us because none of our students have been involved in this program. Um, and we are really interested. And again, in the issue of the mobility, I had a student who traveled over three countries, but then I don't know whether Africans are involved. Could they travel down to Africa in terms of the mobility? Uh, did you get my question? 
I mean, so, I, I got Fabian. I got your question. Of course, you okay. know the Africans. Uh, you know the African students. They can involved in all our activities. Our university, and you know, I think that you have received the email. If not, is organizing particularly for African uh, university in collaboration with Europe at the beginning of April an event in Crete in order to boost this collaboration uh, with African universities. And when we are when we are describing African universities, we are talking about students, academic researchers, administrators, you know, all kinds of stakeholders. This will happen at the beginning of April. You will receive more information by my side by the end of the day. Okay, great. Um, thank you. You are very welcome. I would like to say Fabiana Zema is a partner of us in KA 171 from Nigeria. Uh, they are coming from a very prestigious research university there. And Postas, it's finally your turn. My turn? All right. Uh, first of all, I would like to make a statement and then I will provide very fast the floor to my colleague, uh, George Biodakis, also to announce to our students another initiative that the Athena Alliance is preparing regarding their employability. First of all, I would like to know, to, to inform the community that uh, we are going to receive a funding from my university, from the, the budget of the university to organize the global ESN conference, if we are going to be selected on this. But, you know, this shows us, you know, our priority to collaborate with students, whatever involves students, we would like to participate and host international events. Uh, we, are, we have not been selected, but we are trying to work and be able uh, to host an event if this is happens. I think that, you know, through this discussion, it was so fruitful that I had a lot of questions, but you have answered them, you know, during the during uh, during the, the, the process. But I would like, I think now I have a very big dream to organize. And I think that we should organize uh, the Athena or however I'm going to name it. I would like to be flexible. So I don't want to place names in front of what we would like to do. The, the student conference. So it's student conference with communities, local communities. I think that this will be the next target of mine uh, through the Alliance and through the HMU to organize a conference for students to bring them students together with societies, not only the, with, with universities. So we are going to have the funding to organize this uh, or through you know, the Erasmus mobilities, through you know, the management uh, funds that the universities they are getting. So this is something that has been inspired by all of you. But I have a question now to Rita. And the question, of course, comes to all of you. 25% of student mobility. When we are participating, the European University are talking about 50%. So the ESN is a very close you know, decision maker in Brussels. They say 25%. European University are talking about 50%. And we are in 2% right now. So my question is like the following. What about your the virtual mobility? How What is your position about virtual mobility? Does it will play a role in order to achieve this figure? Or we're talking strictly about physical mobility? The floor is yours, Rita. This question is to you, particularly. Yes, thank you so much. It's a very interesting question. And actually, we have wrote a position paper with as about this topic, actually. So then we actually can contribute also for this. So uh, we are speaking about physical mobility, 25% of physical mobility only. And our, our perspective on virtual mobility is that they should be a path to achieve physical mobility after. There should be a preparation to actually, after to go on a path to physical mobility. The same with BIPs, with blend testing programs. We think that they should also be um, instigated, especially because they can be an opportunity for people with fewer opportunities, because normally also these people cannot have opportunity to go on a, on a physical mobility. But we believe especially that the virtual part of the blend intensive programs should, should be a preparation for the physical part of, of, of the programs. So. Yes, basically summarizing our position paper that I'm gladly would like to send you all. Uh, that's it. Please send it to us because this it will you know direct us a lot in order to take an activity activities towards the achievement of this goal. Uh, I will I will put in the chat. Yes, yes, thank you. I had another one, but I forgot it because I was very much impressed by your points and the maturity of the students. You know how did they state you know their position much better than talking with my colleagues. I have to say. Much better. Uh, so the, I would like to give the floor to our, our colleague, George Leodakis, in order to make another announcement uh, about the activity of Athena that is preparing for the students as well. And it's open to everyone. We are going to share you know, this call to everyone. George? Thank you, Kostas. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, it was nice to hear all these experiences from our students. 
and their interest in uh, various internationalization activities. So let me uh, uh, talk a little about uh, two uh, individual activities uh, in the framework of Athena University Alliance uh, that uh, are to begin in this month, in October, uh, or in uh, end in November. Uh, at first, the Athena Career Days that will take place uh, in uh, all uh, all Thursdays of November. Uh, yeah. ma mainly, it will be uh, panel discussions uh, with focus on uh, local job market uh, issues. The second uh, activity, the second action, will be that of alumni talks. Oh, wait. Uh, 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 where, where uh, graduates of the uh, individual universities of the Athena European University uh, will talk uh, their uh, uh, professional path uh, after graduation and uh, uh, will provide, uh, I suppose, uh, useful information uh, for all other students uh, throughout uh, the other universities and uh, not only. Uh, these uh, alumni talks uh, will be every second uh, third, uh, Tuesday uh, at uh, uh, 3.30 uh, p.m. Uh, Central Europe time. We are going to send an email about this. You yes. know, otherwise the people, they will forget. Yes, and... Uh, to involve also George Saltaki, as we have cooperated in the past, to advertise it at the Erasmus Student Network. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, Kostas. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to go back to the raised hands uh, just for another few minutes. Uh, Abdel Ilah, can I, did, did I do it the right way? Just a moment. It's better to address the questions in the chat, because otherwise we are going to miss them in the chat. So there is one question has been answered to Elena. There's another question by Elena Misraki relates to the language barriers. Are all students and staff prepared for their studies in English? I'm sorry for the people that they have raised their hand, but you know, on the chat, we are missing after a while the questions. So there is a question to all of you. Are all students and staff prepared for their studies in English? I mean, I suspect that if you have any preparation courses in English in order, you know, these barriers that you have mentioned to be lower. So any one of you, if you have any point, Georgos, yes. Uh, what I really think is that uh, we tend to overthink of how much barrier English is uh, for studies and for exchange. And I think having conversation in English or be, being able to communicate, you will be able to go to a mobility. Like you will be able to make your English level better in the mobility, and I think it, it should not be a barrier for you to try. Excellent. This is the position of George. Do we have another position from any other student, or this is the position of all of you? I will provide now the man the management to Carolina, you know, for the face-to-face. -face. Uh, here goes the <laughs> Thank you. Will, will you reply also to this question, or...? Yeah, well, well, whatever. Briefly on the on the learning of English, I completely agree with George. Just to remind that not all the not all the paths, uh, or not the, or not all the fields of education in higher education have the same access to basic learning uh, English English classes, and not even in uh, primary and secondary uh, school education there is not even. Uh, basic classes to English to uh, given to all the students from all the countries equally. So I mean, we can see like really um, uh, unbalance between the learning, the basic uh, English learning from uh, students from one country to another. So I mean, of course, it's accessible in English for most of the students, but there is still uh, things to do. And it's above higher education. Huh? It's primary and secondary education. So not a lot of things that we can do here. And a lot of things that we all have power on, but I mean, there is uh, also a problem to tackle at uh, this level to maybe announce a little bit more the fact that students can speak English uh, and to announce the, the level of English also. Thank you very much. 
you is your hand still raised yes i will take just um, a minute to thank everybody for this very uh, interesting meeting i would have loved to see more moroccans uh, joining the meeting uh, maybe we should uh, we should uh, keep on organizing such uh, encounters to uh, get in touch with each other and to have more people involved the only people i see involved here are from the Temkin foundation as a matter of fact uh, we would like to welcome all of you, reach out to you, reach out to us, so we could work together. Thanks, Costas, for this great opportunity, and I look forward to working with you. Thanks, Athena. Say Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I think Jan Skaliakatsos had raised his hand as well. Thank you, Abdelilah. Uh, Abdelilah comes also, you know, it's a very close partner, a new partner of our university, but of our, of our alliance, you know, like, you know, I hope that we're going to be engaged in more and more activities. We will. Like we will. Well, Please feel free to reach out. We are here for you. Okay. Janis Kaliakatsos has a comment. Let's ve to be very fast in order to close because it's 12 yes, yes, I know. Uh, thank you all of you, especially the students who participated in this meeting. Uh, I don't know if uh, somebody else has asked the same question because I had to leave for some, more, uh, some minutes. Uh, I have to ask my students if... Uh, they think that uh, uh, the stay for six months abroad is enough or you need to have uh, more time, uh, uh, for example, one year to stay abroad for your mobility. This is the one. And the second one, uh, do you believe that uh, BIP uh, uh, project, BIP project Erasmus uh, are uh, something to... Uh, to connect uh, uh, virtual and uh, physical uh, mobility and is something to motivate uh, the students to participate in Erasmus activities. These two questions and uh, sorry if I take the, the time. Thank you very much for the questions, Rita. Yes, thank you for the question. I can fastly answer both of them. Regarding the preferred option of students is actually the mobility of five to six months. They actually prefer to go on this on this option of mobility. Uh, of course, it, all, it, all it depends on the background and on the motivation of students. So sometimes what happens is that they go on this six months mobility and then they actually do other mobility in master or on when they go to, to, to other studies or they go to trainerships as well. So it actually depends. But what we see also is that for people with fewer opportunities, it's actually the preferred method of, of, of mobility. So it's the one that we advise the most in these cases. Also for BIPs, we also advise BIPs also in the cases of people with fewer opportunities as well, because if they cannot go uh, on mobility for, for several reasons, they actually have the opportunity to participate in this, in this new form of mobility. What we are seeing in BIPs is that BIPs at the moment are not the most well-known form of mobility. So we are advising for this to be more well communicated to, to students uh, for their participation. But it, it goes a bit to what I said before. We believe that BIPs uh, are a pathway to the physical mobility and students could be able to change if they want to go on the five or six or one year mobility after. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rita. And Nuno? Well, I would just like to stress the 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 relevance of these uh, forms of virtual mobility and blended mobility um covid has bring this a lot into uh, uh, into the front line but i believe that virtual mobility and virtual mobility is still seen as the second division of mobility we should be very careful with this because virtual mobility blended mobility are probably the only chances for hundreds for thousands of students that cannot go on international contact during their studies in other way there are financial reasons family reasons health reasons professional reasons many barriers for uh, for physical mobility and we should not give universities should give all these students a full portfolio of possibilities to go mobile, even virtual mobility, and don't place this in the second league 
of mobility because this is the only possibility that many of our students have to have this international contact to benefit from this during their studies because for some reasons they cannot go uh, uh, physical. That's what I would like to add to the, to, add to the discussion. Thank you very much for this. It was really amazing to have this uh, discussion. It's, uh, we should have booked two hours courses for this. We have Thank to... you very much, Nuno. <laughs> I think that Tangue would like Tangui would like to make this a comment, and I think that we should close. Yeah, just um, as a, thank you for the flowers. Just a quick uh, uh, reply to what Nuno just said about virtual exchange and not exchange and not mobility, because I mean it's. Um, I will um, be maybe more careful on what we want with virtual uh, exchange, um, because of course it uh, it will be a way to um, create some first contact, uh, international contact for some students. But then it's a matter of what we want. Do we want for the students who have the means to go abroad to have physical mobility, and for all the students who do not have the means to afford themselves because they do not have the family that can. Uh, 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 have their back or they do not have access to enough funds to only have the virtual way of having an exchange and then create a two-tier system within mobility, the one for the wealthier students to go abroad physically and for the uh, the one who do not have the means to remain physical uh, online. That's a decision and that's a discussion that at some point we will have to, to have because to create some first link. And I mean, when it's hybrid, uh, to have some parts online and some part physical, that's um, that's a good way to uh, indeed maybe create some first link and then to maybe make it easier for the students then uh, when you go um, physically, because you already know the person that you will meet because you already met them online, but only have um, uh, uh, online exchange and online experience and count them as physical mobility and count them as mobility is, according to us, maybe a problem because, as I said, it creates a two-tier system uh, within mobility, which is, I mean, quite problematic in a sense. So, yeah, I would be maybe more more careful on what we want and on the, I mean, it's purely semantic, but uh, on what we want and what we call what we want. Yeah, that's only the small remark that I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, just la one last question, uh, uh, sentence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I wish we could continue this discussion because we should be very, um, let's not lose opportunities because of semantics. As, uh, so it's, yeah, virtual mobility, virtual exchange. Um, it's just a matter of words, but the most, critical thing and the, the most important thing is what what students get out of this regardless of what we name it regardless of what we call it the important thing it, it it's not only for the students for the teachers as well the the most important thing that we get out of this is the opportunity to have this international contact to experience new different cultures different to have the opportunity to work with the students that have a different background a different that come from a different region in in in, in europe this is the critical what we name it is not relevant if we name it virtual mobility virtual exchange, internationalization at home, whatever. The important thing is that the students should have this opportunity to interact internationally during their studies. And many of them cannot do this uh, physically. But I'm sure that we will organize one session just to discuss this point that I believe would be very interesting. Thank you very much. Cut. Cut. Thank you. Thank you very much. As you can see, the university staff is as enthusiastic as the students are. So. <laughs> I would like to thank you all. Uh, your port point of view is very important for those who are managing the, the process, uh, but your enthusiasm has a great role for students who are still undecided. Thank you to all the listeners. Thank you, Kostas, for the invitation. Let's update our meeting for tomorrow because tomorrow the old generation will speak about internationalization. So at the same time, you know, the old generation will set up, you know, their points. What is it? What is the internationalization from the academics point of view? So I, I will send you the invitation in order to participate and continue this discussion with them tomorrow. And of course, you know, I will renew. This is like a very big bet for my university now and for Athena, I will say, to, in, to, to organize this student conference and, you know, these talks and these discussions to be a whole week, not just, you know, uh, like uh, 90 minutes. 
So I would like to thank all of you. I would like to thank Carolina. Excellent. Uh, moderation, I would say. All of you for your very inspiring, you know, ideas and, uh, and um, inputs and uh, proposals. I hope that if we are going to implement 20% of them, we're going to be a better university uh, very soon. So thank you. And, you know, we will see again tomorrow, uh, hopefully in order to challenge the old generation and, you know, directly uh, propose your activities to them. So until tomorrow, bye and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.